Um, we, we talked for two hours, we came back, and all of you guys are here again. So it appears that you want to hear more. Um, what would you like to hear more about? Uh, let, let, me, let me see if anybody has any, any questions. So we have been throwing at you almost like from a fire hose, a bu bunch of random things, right? We talked about different container runtimes. Um, we talked about um, you know, how they could be orchestrated. But we kind of stayed at the you know, tool set level. Um, do you want to see more about what it looks like from a user's perspective? Do you want to see more about what it looks like from an administrator perspective? Both, OK. Administrator. User. You said something about the kind of grouping uh, your users and putting them on different uh, systems, or right? Different clouds, if you could say about how you do that. Yeah. Okay. Conversation around that. Okay. So what what fits where? So kind of point in general directions based on different use cases. What else? All right. So we'll we'll keep going and um, again jump in when you have questions. And if, it, if something is kind of muddy and it's not very clear, which I think all of it is, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll try to clarify it. Would it be okay if I sit down so I can, all right, good, I will in just a second. So I was going to make this a question, but I, I get boring when I keep asking questions to people. So um, I borrowed this from an analyst uh, presentation yesterday. The conversation was that about 2% of all high performance computing spend is already in the cloud. Um, high performance computing spend is, depends on who you ask, uh, between 35 billion and 40 billion dollars a year. That includes all hardware, software, and services. It excludes all of you guys. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any um, headcount in it. Uh, it completely excludes power, cooling, and things like that as well. So we, we are spending a significant amount of money on high performance computing, and about 2% two per, two of that went to the cloud. Uh, people talk about, in general IT terms, let's, you know, which is a much bigger total spend, um, close to 10% is in the cloud already. So when they count software as a service and um, you know, people running your mail servers in the cloud, et cetera, that, that totals to about 10%. So in HPC as an industry, we are quite far behind. And um, one thing I keep wondering is why. Maybe this is partially why. 35% of us apparently touched the cloud for um, testing high performance computing workloads in the cloud. So it's not that we are not paying attention, I think, I mean, the room being full is a testament to that. We are paying attention, but maybe we're not satisfied with what we're seeing yet. So uh, this is a tough crowd to sell to, I can tell you that much. Um, now, within, within this realm, I, I talk to uh, Christian about this often, what are the, kind of, what are the type of workloads um, which seem to work relatively well uh, in cloud scenarios? And which ones are the ones which eh, are more questionable? Um, when it comes to, for example, uh, research, meaning I'm, I'm going to take uh, half a million cores and do something with it, those type of workloads are probably not yet for the cloud. Um, if you are doing massively, embarrassingly parallel, uh, someone was talking about that earlier. Um, so embarrassingly parallel applications, um, cloud seems to be a great place for those. Um, MPI is still something that uh, puzzles a lot of cloud people. Um, uh, th the reason for that is uh, cloud has its own way of defining networks. Um, they, a lot of cloud providers do not have um, InfiniBand or OmniPath type of high-speed interconnects. That seems to choke a lot of MPI workloads. Um, my personal experience is that um, if, you're, if you're running up to maybe 10, 10 nodes, if your application size fits into that, it's usually all right. You can, you can get away with it uh, in the cloud. Um, if, if you're going to run anything bigger, then look for a cloud provider which has a high-speed backbone. Um, it's, it's also very useful to differentiate cloud versus um, 
you know, public cloud versus private cloud. Um, the, the definition of HPC versus what a private cloud is is also getting starting to get very blurry. I have seen private cloud environments, which look like a cloud but have an infinite band backend, has GPUs, whatnot. Just the way they schedule workloads is not what we are used to. It's not one of the, what, 15, 20 um, resource provider we, we always use in our HPC environments. They don't have those, but um, when it comes to running a workload, you can still, you can still make it happen in a, in a cloud setting. Okay, so uh, if you have questions about what, what seems to work, what seems to not work, I can go further about that. Um, the, uh, I'll touch on the administrator experience. Uh, when it comes to <coughs> administration of an HPC environment, um, Christian and I always um, talk about share everything versus share nothing type of mindsets. In the cloud, people don't share anything. Users don't share anything. They are in their own VMs. Um, everything's isolated. There's a software-defined networking stack on top. You, you're not even on the same subnet as another user, if you, if you expand it a little bit. But when it comes to an HPC center, everything happens to be shared. So that puts a lot of, um, let's say, additional load on the shoulders of HPC administrators when they think about cloud-like strategies. We encouraged you to look at what's happening in the cloud and pull it into your environment. Well, many times what we find is that there's a translation that needs to happen, and um, th this is bec that, that's the reason why, um, because the mindset from a computer, computer science perspective is quite different. Christian, is there something you want to add to that? Yeah, you, you feel a little bit uh, unease. Yeah. Now, don't you think that's also, um, I have to check it right here myself. Um, oh yeah, I can do it like this. Um, don't you think that's more uh, also this data problem that you have to put the stuff up to the cloud in order to use it and then you have to get it down again? I mean, if you have workloads with little input files and little output files, that may be okay, but if you don't, then how about that? I mean, this is a data gap, right? Yeah. Um, th this is a very significant problem. Uh, many of us deal with uh, data sizes which are massive. Um, the cloud providers have heard, they said, okay, we'll, we'll put a lease line all the way to your data center. And then they calculated, oh, well, it would still take a year and a half to transfer that kind of data. Then they said, we'll send a truck. Uh, you, you guys have heard those, right? They literally send a truck to your facility, which you can d upload your data into. They will truck it away. I, I talked to a customer, they calculated it, they needed 45 trucks. So <laughs> there is, there's big, there's very big, there's massive, but the answer that I give to everyone when they ask this question, I say, look, pick one workflow first. You, you don't have to transfer 45 truckloads of data to solve one of your problems, just look for one, move that to the cloud, see if it works for you, and, and, then, and then we'll talk about it. So I, I'm not seeing, cases, many cases I should say, where uh, somebody drops their entire data center strategy like Netflix very popularly did a number of years ago and completely move to the cloud. I, I don't think that's the real use case. In HPC, I think hybrid is, uh, is many times the solution. But, okay, one, one, <laughs> one more. I mean, if you do this hybrid model and you say, I put a couple of workloads in the cloud, then you you have to have you have both uh, both both data centers basically right you you still have your on-prem stuff you cannot go back from this you you have to keep the backups you you have to do all this operations load on premise and you just overspill to maybe to the cloud but then the complexity of your operations is really much higher right because you have to operate both and you have to understand both and um, you have to trust both so then also a hindrance to not go to the cloud as well. Uh, totally. Uh, attaching cloud into your infrastructure, we'll talk about a few patterns here, um, um, is it, an interesting question mark. Um, you know, why would I do it? Um, I'll borrow an analogy from a good friend of mine, uh, Jason, who is the uh, founder and CEO of uh, CycleCloud. And it, he says, hey, there's a bus and then there's a Ferrari. So maybe you, you can think about it in two ways. Either you see your data center as your bus or your Ferrari, depends on your own analogy, and try to get people who can ride the bus into the bus so they can get out of the way of the Ferrari. And the people can, who need the Ferrari can use the Ferrari. So his, his perspective is, um, if you have, a, for example, um, an HPC uh, type environment and people are using it for single threaded applications, well, 
maybe you just want them out of there and so that you don't have this uh, resource starvation problem. So um, the, the type of use cases I found successful is when there's that one outlier that doesn't quite fit into their environment, throwing that to the cloud, um, separating it, and somehow uh, shuttling the data back and forth seems to be a good use case. Um, when, when you have workflows that cannot be broken, you have to be careful about those. Don't take the middle step of a 10-step process and throw that to the cloud. You'll always fail at that. So it needs to be something that's a bit isolated. Maybe we just go back and forth here. But if you guys have questions or comments, uh, so feel free. Um, but maybe, as you said, taking the, the workloads you hate first, maybe. So the problematic workflows for your data center maybe is also something that you that might be valuable. Just you know, what doesn't doesn't fit or doesn't fit your your data center is maybe the first thing that you want to move somewhere else because you have more optimized um, yeah facilities in AWS. We have FPA, FPGAs nowadays, GPUs, and with Arcuda, you could also have uh, yeah, a distributed. Uh, a GPU cluster that you can use from from somewhere else. So, and I would like to have this R CUDA uh, founder here, but he has no time. But anyway, maybe next year. Anyway, yeah, but maybe this this the specific workloads and the special workloads that you put first somewhere else, so to utilize what's out there, and yeah. you don't have the um, the investment to make yourself. Yeah. Can just experiment with stuff. Maybe also experimentation, right? That's also yeah. something. You, you you use the keyword. Um, he said investment. Cost is. Is that something that people are curious about? Cost? Mm -hmm. Cost of cloud? OK. No MBS here. <laughs> <No MBC. laughs> yeah, I, I should deal with that, right? Cost, is that an interesting topic? Yeah, so yeah. May, may, maybe, maybe we say a few words generically about it, and then uh, we'll see if any questions pop up. So in terms of cost of cloud, you should, you should look at it this way. If you're looking for a rental, I mean, right, right? Just the analogy of renting a car. If you're renting it every day for a whole year, it's probably more expensive than owning a car, right? It kind of makes sense because you have flexibility. Uh, the provider still needs to make money, right? When you go to the cloud, somebody has to make money. And there are lots of operational costs that you don't have to incur anymore. So what, what we have observed, and we have put out a number of papers about this, is if your cluster's usage is way above 50%, I'll just leave it at that. So we, we have much precise numbers around that. But if you're way over 50% already, you're, you probably should own something in-house. Um, but that does not mean you should not ever go to the cloud. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. The idea is, if you have bursty workloads, it does make sense that you would look at the cloud. There's no point in having a data center with 15% utilization. Now, when you look at your job scheduler, that might be fooling you, though. You, so this utilization question is a very interesting question. I want to just say um, productive utilization. So if you have a cluster, it's always 95% full. But I guess some people are testing, some people are playing with it, et cetera, et cetera. So useful utilization. Um, the, the other thing that's very important to note is if you know what kind of infrastructure you need, um, let's say, for a three-year period, and you are multiplying the cost you see on a cloud provider's website by 365 times three, you're making a gross error. Call them up and tell them, you need 10,000 cores for three years, and what's the price I can get for that? And it is not going to be what's on their website. So think about those kind of things. If you're buying a dedicated uh, equipment for a number of years, the price is not what's on the website for an hourly rate. And maybe. I would just try to make this microphone work, but um, if you also could say, I use this when you have dark hours. So not only having it when you need it, but say, I and we are as a cloud provider, or not cloud provider, but a user of the cloud, we are doing the same, right? We have lots of machines, and we are only using it when people are playing. So all the dark hours, you can utilize it somewhere else. And the same goes for AWS. If they have a data center that is not utilized during the night, they don't shut down the nodes, because as we all know, that makes that was out the hardware fastest, so if you can promise them that you only use it in the dark hours, then they would say, yeah, sure, we do. Yeah, all major providers currently have, they call it preemptive or uh, spot or whatever their brand name for it is, they have a different price set for their unused capacity. If you can live with, oh, I'm going to be shut down without notice uh, type of paradigm, it works pretty well. Most of the time, this kind of application is 
system? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Good question. So the question was about what what happens with uh, file sy file systems. So um, what what we found in what we found in the cloud is there is you know usually two types of storage. There is ephemeral storage, meaning the 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 storage on the uh, on the system on the uh, let's say VM that you're running on, and these are uh, volatile. You know, when you shut it down, you lose all that data. Um, the performance of those uh, of those ephemeral storage is uh, is very good, um, and many providers are providing SSD disks, and they are updating their environments fairly frequently. So they have recent hardware. So th th we found the performance, scratch space performance, to be very good. Then the second level is you can always create an NFS-like uh, file system in one of the nodes and then share it to the others. If you're doing a small deployment, exactly. That does not scale, was the comment. So if you're using a few nodes, let's say a dozen, maybe two, you can get away with it. If you're doing something bigger, then you need to look at some kind of a high performance file system. Nowadays, there's quite a bit of uh, forward momentum on that. So uh, for example, I stopped by at ISC at various vendors booths and asked them, do you guys have anything in the cloud? Uh, a few of them said, yeah, we are readily available on so-and-so's marketplace. So th they are paying attention and they're porting their systems over. So give it another year, I would say, and this, sh this problem should solve itself out. Sorry, yes? Sorry, just just uh, file systems. Um, I'm very interested in this uh, BGFS file system. I mean, uh, maybe you guys heard about it as well. Fraunhofer? Yeah, from Fraunhofer. I, I, I know the guy for a couple of years, but anyways. And they have this new Beyond file system, which is on-demand file system. So you could potentially spin up virtual machines in AWS and then use Beyond to create an on-demand file system just with the nodes that you're working with. So, and, and then you don't need a server, right? So you can just use your compute nodes um, also as, uh, as a scratch file system, yeah, I think. To be one of the ones I talked to. Um, I just wanted to point it out. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Happens to be one of the ones that I talked to, BGFS, and uh, they said they have two approaches. Either you can um, use the disks on the um, the SSD disks on on all of the systems, and BGFS will pull it all and make it look like one uh, file system with striping and with high availability uh, built into the mechanism. So that could be very interesting to look at. Um, uh, the, the, the real question I asked them was, when data is moving around, you know, what is it being transported by? They said, sure, it's Ethernet currently, but they are working with one of the providers uh, to, to use RDMA networking, which, which will make it much more appealing. Yeah. Yes. AWS, oh sorry, AWS has Twitter 5 gigabit nowadays. They just announced it. Right. And they also, I mean, you could use Rookie over, over this 25 gigabit. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you'd probably end up with decent performance there, too. Yes? Uh, the demand is to make um, a fast distributed scratch. It's not to have a permanent data. Right. So that, that's, that, that's the one um, which, which is very interesting. And um, we, are, we were all kind of sharing thoughts that uh, looking at BGFS is a good idea. Permanent shared file system accessing uh, accessible by 50 nodes uh, simultaneously. Right, a and again, it's not completely solved yet, but they are paying attention to it. Is is what I've found out at the ISC. I was very curious about this, but it, it's completely logical, right? So the first problem out there was single VM performance wasn't great. Then we said, <coughs> oh, they solved that. Then the next point was, oh, multi-node performance isn't great. Well. They are working on that, solving that, and now the storage becomes a bottleneck. So they are, they are trying to address individual points as they go along. Any other questions about storage? Yes? Oh, sorry, no, stop, not stop. Uh, anything. We'll take whatever your question is. Um, basically, um, if I look at it from the point of view of um, user support, uh, which I provide uh, for the HPC cluster, then my question is, suppose that uh, we move certain workloads to the cloud. Um, one of the things I really, really need to know to uh, provide support is the, um, uh, is the properties of the hardware which the software is running on. So I've no experience with cloud providers. So the question is, basically, um, do you have access to that information? 
Yeah, so the question is, when, when you are uh, troubleshooting a thorny problem with high-performance computing, you need to know exactly what kind of system you're on, and do cloud providers give you accurate enough information about that? Um, the, the, the answer is yes and no. It, it, it's not that the uh, providers are really trying to hide something from you, but there's a pathological liar between you and the hardware, right? That's called the VM layer. So the, the, the VM is lying to you. So the, it gets very difficult. I, I have seen systems where it says one socket, one, uh, one CPU core, and then 32 threads. I'm like, I know that's not true, but that's what, that's what it's telling me. And the CAE code I was trying to run simply would not accept it. It said, oh, these are all hypervisor cores. I'm going to run on one core. OK. So um, it, this is more about them cleaning up their, um, their properties inside of their uh, hypervisor setups. Um, th the problem that I faced was three years ago. Uh, now they don't have that problem. So they, they are fixing it as they go. Um, I don't think it's still very accurate, but it's getting there. The other thing is um, HT being turned on or off, um, you know, the um, hyper-threading. Um, almost all providers have it turned on because they, they want to show as many cores as possible. But if you ask for their HPC SKUs, HPC systems, um, many of them now have a separate set of VMs for HPC. Um, some of them have HT turned off, so you're getting physical cores which makes it much more suitable. With respect to network properties and some yeah. of course also pretty important. Yeah, yeah. Ne networking is a sore spot. Um, unless you are running on a cloud provider's hardware which has some sort of um, high available, I'm sorry, um, high throughput networking built in and they advertise that, um, you're not going to get the performance that you're looking for. All right, how are we doing in terms of time? Keep going a little bit or stop here? No, what, what would you like? Go ahead a little bit and then... Okay, maybe a quick unscripted demo of some kind, huh? Get, get, yeah. people, get people excited and thinking. All right, so uh, if you can stand me typing with one, one hand. No, I don't. I can, I can hold the microphone. Come on. All right, so... Um, one, one thing I did was um, I wanted to show that in the cloud you can get user experiences which are similar to running in, an, in your own local data center. And um, the, um, I literally created this demo while I was sitting here and not listening to the other speakers, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and <laughs> yeah, I should get up. No, I was, I was definitely listening. Um, so the demo I put together, I um, launched um, a virtual machine in the cloud and I asked the specific software, ANSYS, to be deployed as a part of it. So um, I don't have it here, but the installation manual of ANSYS for Linux only, for single node is 60 pages. They are a little descriptive. So being able to cut through all that and launch an environment within minutes would be interesting, I thought. So I did it. And um, uh, now, now I'll show you the properties of the environment. Um, and if I can, I'm on a borrowed machine. So forgive me if I do silly things. Don't delete stuff. Don't delete stuff? OK. Can I add stuff? So um, I am SSHing into the, uh, this is probably too small for your, for your eyes. So I SSHed into the um, container I created in the cloud, although I don't know the username and password of the host that was created for me. So um, the, the, the guys at Docker, they were a platform as a service company before they became a software company. So I'm using what they are now selling as, as Docker, uh, almost like a platform. So I don't have access to the host, but as a user, I don't have access to the host, but I have access to the container that was created for me. And I'm a fictitious user. Uh, I, I received a random password, and I'm now logged in to that environment. Okay, great. So um, if this environment is set up properly for me, um, I should be able to say that. Okay, great. So MPI is there. Um, so that's one, one hurdle. Um, the software I want to use, I said, was uh, ANSYS, okay, which sells this software. 
Okay, great. So my ANSYS is installed. If it's installed properly, I should be able to um, see their help page. I'll leave it there. Okay. Uh, again, they are descriptive, so long help page. So as, as a user, the experience that I just got is um, somebody gave me a VM and it's already set up for what I want to do. My, my training is already done. Is, it, is this interesting? No, no, probably none of you guys will go, oh my god, that's amazing. Now, uh, I'll add a few layers on top. Yes? How about Yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's So we have MBAC. Let, let's take a pause. Yeah. So, um, the uh, UberCloud, my company, happens to be a cloud hosting partner, a legal partner of ANSYS. So we do have licenses of ANSYS. A user would have to bring their own license for this environment work. So, good question. Commercial software in the cloud, um, five years ago was quite tough, but they have been listening to their users and m almost every major ISV, with a few of them accepted, um, now have, I should say, cloud-friendly licenses. Um, when, when we first started, the two experiences I remember was in one case, they sent us a dongle to plug it into the... <laughs> We, we, and we seriously, we seriously talked to the cloud provider. They said, fine, send it. We sent it to them. But by the time they got it and was able to plug it into a machine, it was already expired. So um, we don't do that anymore. Um, and the second, second case I, I remember is um, the, the, the provider, the software provider said, sure, as long as the data center is within 20 miles from your location. And we were like, wow, that's, that's going to be tough. <laughs> so anyway. Um, Command line access to, to cloud resources, uh, okay, um, partially interesting, but I, I, here's, here's something that might make it a little more challenging. So deploy in the cloud uh, with a graphical user interface. So again, we're in a uh, we are in a container running on the cloud. We have a full desktop view um, and let's so usually by the time I get to this point, the, um, the engineer tells me, get your fingers off of that. I know how to use it now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. So um, one of the things that I, I get asked a lot is, what is the uh, graphical user interface uh, performance like? And in, in the not so distant past, it used to be uh, not very good. Uh, nowadays, the performance is not that bad either. So. It, it almost feels like it's running on my desktop computer. Um, the ones that are more experienced in the room, they will immediately go, but you're just opening windows. So, uh, okay, so this is now a 3D model. So, and we are on a hotel internet, we are using VM.